You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, life life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. I've been talking about reflections in our, our Christian conduct and how we reflect upon it, how we um, really hold a mirror up to ourselves to see kind of, am I living this thing out the way God is calling me to? And we've been in Ephesians 5 for a little while where the pericope talks about us walking in love. And verse number 17 is where we left off last week because we've been talking about this issue of of our standards and um, our just our being consistent before God. And so we began this conversation about our stability um, and, and areas that we need to show stability, a, a correct walk, a constant witness. And after we talked about a correct walk and a constant witness, verse 17 was just waving at me. And so I wanna, I wanna call on it <laughs> since it's been waving in the class. And in, in chapter 5, verse 17, it says, therefore, do not be foolish. Here it is. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Um, so letter C is that we need to will consciously. As we reflect on what God wants us to be and how God wants us to walk, I need to walk correctly. We learned that last week, witness constantly. And we talked about our witness is much more than what I say. It's very much how I live my life, right? How I manage my resources, how I handle difficulty and complication and, and how I live out my responsibilities. All of that is part of my witness. But then we get to this point where he says, you have to know what God's will is. And this is not cliche. This is just absolute truth. The safest place in the world is in the will of God. So understanding what that will is, I want to spend a few moments doing this. So I'm going to jot, have you jot down a couple words. We are reminded in Romans 12 that we ought not be conformed to this world, right, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, right? So let me define terms really quickly because we could look this up in a biblical dictionary or do word searches, all that. Let me just give you the James Gale, your practical application definition for the will of God. The practical definition for the will of God is God's choice for me. Or let me say it another way. The practical way of looking at the will of God is what is God's daily desire for me? Now, this is and that's really how I always like to frame God's will. God's daily desire. Jot that down. Say that out. Daily desire. Because, see, let me tell you what happens. What happens is when we think oftentimes about the will of God, it's usually future oriented. So the reason we miss it is because if, if, if I'm trying to get to a destination, if I start wrong, it's going to be really difficult to get to that destination. Right. So we too oftentimes think about what does God want in my future? What does he want me to do a year from now, five years from now? How about what is God's desire for me today? Right. And so if I begin framing, you know, we would not say some things, do some things, try some things that we do. If we were to ask ourselves ahead of time, is this God's desire for me today? Does he really want me here today? Does he really want me to say this today? Does he? So we think about it from that perspective. Now, I'm going to probably disappoint in, a, in, in some ways, because when we think about and talk about the will of God, we want like the the crash course. And when you get done teaching the day, pastor, I have it all figured out. And it goes is harder than that because it requires more than that. And so I'm going to give you some words to just these just the jot down because it's going to take us on this progression. It's going to take us in this dynamic. This is now some of y'all already out the gate on this one. The first word I want you to write down is salvation. Because and, and if, if I, people are listening or you downloaded this podcast, um, understand, be clear. 
God wants you saved. And so I know you want a wife. I know you want a husband. I know you want a baby. God wants you saved. So don't get all bent out of shape and caught up in all that. That's number one. So for you, you're in Bible study, you're in the studio, you know, most of y'all, y'all should be saved, right? And so we know that piece of it, but there's some other things that, that factor into God's will for me. And let me just say this. As believers, each of us are responsible for learning and obeying God's will in our life. Like this is not someone else's responsibility. This is my responsibility is to discover and begin living out what God's will is for me. And be clear about this. God is not hiding it. Right. So I don't want you feeling like it. So let me just be really clear. If you are not clear about his will, and that's the whole point of this teaching right now, it is not because he is hiding it from you. It's because I've not done the work necessary to get it fully revealed. It's not concealed. It is revealed. So now let me give you the second word. The second word I want you to write down, I'm going to alliterate this with the letter S. The second word I want you to write down is sanctification. Now, the reason that matters, first Peter, if you want some a biblical reference, first Peter, chapter two, verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So in other words, he's saying that the second part of, of understanding the will of God is just living as holy as I can. It, I think. And you've heard me say this, but I think it's time now that we've come back that we get reminded of this. It's not it's not a good strategy to keep asking God for the next thing when I'm not I've not done the last thing. Like, that's just not a good strategy. Like, God is like, you want you want to know my will for you for next week. But I told you what my will for you was last month and you still behind on that one. And so we have to recognize that it, it, it is a progressive work. And the more I live a sanctified life. Um, the, the more I then can position myself to understand. It's just living a decent life, right? Um, First Thessalonians says, chapter four, verse three, says, for this is the will of God, our sanctification, right? So now, so se step two to understand his will is just live, just live right. Now here's, now I'm gonna help us live right. But here's the third thing. The third thing I want you to write down is to seek. Um, Second Corinthians chapter eight says, um, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. We have to seek out his will for our life. So I should be asking myself, God, what is it that you want for my career? What is it? You know, I went through this when I when I got called to full time ministry, um, you know, because I was just kind of like, God, I, I'm, I know I'm selling you out. Would you make it clear for me where you want me? We should be asking him, what do you want for my career? You know, I, if I have young people on college campuses listening to me right now, I mean, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is just to go do what you want to do. And I know it feels like that's what we should do, but you can. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to share something with you that's going to, I think, will be helpful in a minute to that statement. So I should be saying, God, what is your will for my family? Um, I don't want to offend anybody, and I hope I don't. God, I hope you hear my heart on this. I have, as a pastor, have seen, and it's been heartbreaking for me. I have seen people beat themselves up, cry fall into depression, anger, bitterness over an inability to have children. And I'm not minimizing the desire for that. I need you to hear that. But generally, when they go through that, they've usually never said to God, is this your will for me? Let me I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but let, let me just let, let me go in sequence man. then I'll, I'll get to that point. So really seeking out God's will for me. I'm telling you, that thing 
is going to help put it at ease, whatever he's doing. Because a lot of times, a lot of times we, we don't really want to know what he want. Because then that means I'm going to have to put my stuff on, on hold and not do what I want to do. So I'm like, I'm not going I'm not going to ask. I'm not asking. I have to legitimately seek it. Um, and then here's the other word I want you to write down. Sureness. What I, what I mean by that is I want you to have a certainty that he will reveal it. I want, I want us to have, I want us to, because, and, and let me tell you what's going to happen. When you get the will, it's going to be peace attached to it. So I want you to have confidence. I want us to have confidence that it can be discerned. It can be with certainty. I can get it. I can learn it. It can. Now, but here's the here's, here is where I was trying to get us to jot down the word satisfaction. I want to go back to the comment I made about childbearing. It could be about this could be for some of my single people that, you know, you just can't figure out why am I still single? Right. I want you to, this is very important as it relates to God's will. I have to be convinced that what he wants for me is, has a greater level of satisfaction than what I want for me. I have to be convinced about it. So this is where I'm going. This is going to help somebody. I'm here to tell you that if it is God's will for you to be single, you are going to be happier single than you ever would have been married. And you got to be convinced about that. You know, it's, it, listen, it's some folk. I might as well just go ahead and deal with married folk. It's some married folk not real happy. And it, it's not it's, it's because God was like, I really wanted you single, but you just had to have a man. Like, I really wanted you single, but you just had to have a woman. So I have to become convinced like this is hard for me as a pastor. Like I, you know, and I hope you all can handle my honesty and transparency. I did not want this for me. You know, I wanted to go to medical school. I, I got accepted to medical school. I want to go to medical school. You know, I want to be a, a traumatologist. I want people to bleed all over me. I want to kind of save lives in the trauma room. That's like what I want to do. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to be over top of the cadaver, cutting them open, and that, that, that's what I wanted for me. So I have moments when, like, ministry just working me over. And I'm like, man, I wonder what my life would look like had I gone to medical school. Like, I play that game with myself, right? I'd be like, man, I, I have off weekends. You know, won't nobody care if I buy a Porsche? You know, won't nobody care if I make go on first class when I fly? Right? I'm like, man, how, that would be like the life. And then I'm reminded, boy, don't kid yourself. Your life would not have been more satisfying pursuing your will. It would, and you have to be convinced of that thing. Right. So because otherwise, I'm going to tell you why, because when God reveals it, if you're not convinced your life is better for pursuing it, you won't. And, and I'm going to tell you, I know people. God told them no, but they were convinced they would be happier if they said yes. And they said yes. And now they're struggling. And so and so. Satisfaction is key to knowing the will of God. Now, here's the next word I want you to write down. I got like 10 of them. The next word I want you to write down is situations. Because as I'm learning the will of God, as I'm trying to figure out the highest and greatest purpose for my life, and just jot that down. What's the highest and greatest purpose of my life? That's really what satisfaction is about. It's the highest and greatest purpose of my life. And so this issue of asking myself, is what, go, is what is going on in my life now conducive to what I'm claiming God is saying for me to do? Because I think oftentimes we don't recognize that God reveals himself through the circumstances and the situations of our life. You know, and, and so we have to recognize even when, when difficult stuff is going on, you know, when you have to bury someone that you weren't expecting or there's a diagnosis in your life that you weren't expecting to come. I've got to say, God, how are you moving in this situation in my life? How are you showing your will for where I'm at right now today? Because a lot of times we're pursuing stuff that the situations in our life, they don't add up. Like I'm, I'm like, it's just like not making sense. Right. And so we have to make sure that's the next word is sense. 
I've got to. I've got to approach God's will with some common sense. (laughs) You know, I've got to ask myself, you know, because God doesn't ask us to abandon our intellect just because we have faith. Amen, Pastor. He, He wants us to think through some stuff. Right. He wants us to use our human intelligence and our reasoning. You know, if if, you know, I don't know. You meet a man and. You know, you're like, man, I'm really thinking God's telling me, you know, this is the one for me. And, you know, but his whole life he's been beating women. And, you know, he's abusive and violent. Use some sense. You know, God is not saying abandon that. Well, you know, no, you God saying think through some stuff. Right. And so and so. And then the other the other word I want you to write down is saints. Um, seeking counsel of godly people. You know, um, jot this down or remember this. God's will is rarely found in a vacuum. God's will, when God shows himself, he's showing it to somebody else too. Right. He's and I think one of the mistakes we make is that we abandon. We can easily abandon everybody else who's walking with the same God because I'm so convinced I heard God and I'm right. And I'm here to tell you, God, you know, that's 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 a call to ministry. That's how a call to ministry works, too. You know, a lot of times people are like, well, man didn't call me. God called me. That's true. But when God calls you, he tells man. So if there's no man on the earth that sees my calling, I'm doubting if you're called. So so we have to start wrecking. You know, I see this all the time and I'm not talking about it can't always be when I say the saints, it can't always be grandmama and mama. As much as I love the wisdom of mama and I love the wisdom of grandmama, sometimes we have our emotional ties to people where we want what we want for them. And it don't matter what God is saying. And they don't even know they stuck there, you know, because they just love us. Right. So I got to be careful that it's not people that have some bias where they're kind of missing, you know, what God might be saying for me. I'm almost done. I want to try to get us. This is all the stuff I need to be thinking through, praying through as I'm trying to understand God's will for my life. The, The next word is 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 scripture is scripture. And so is it consistent with the word of God? Um, You know, and I'm going to talk about kind of what that looks like, because the more closely I adhere to the word, the greater the likelihood is I'm going to surrender to his will. Then jot down the wrote the word supplication. Right. I need to be praying. Um, God reveals himself to us just in our quiet time. I think sometimes we just too loud and busy to hear his will. You know, and I think if we just learn to go sit down and to be quiet and to just sit in his presence and be in his presence and not, you know, always talking to other people. God, just give it a moment. Let God do some talking. But I've learned in my own life, I'm missing the obvious sometimes because I'm so right in it. That his will is like, I'm, it's right there, but I'm just not seeing it because I'm so close to this thing. And so taking some time in prayer and I would encourage you having some other people praying. Just, hey, look, would you be would you pray that I, I get it right? Pray that I hear God's will. Um, I, I have learned in my life. I'm seeing this over and over again. Um, and you think believers wouldn't think this way, but we do think this way. Man, we can get angry and emotional and we can just respond on what we want. And never have we thought, well, let me ask God first. Let me, God, is this your will for me? So I think spending that time in prayer, pumping the brakes, you know, whether you, you know, there are people listening that need a church home. You shouldn't join this church or any other church until you really feel like it's God's will. You know, don't get sucked into the emotion of the moment. You know, God is this. The same is true of leaving. You know, most folk who leave didn't get permission. And can I just share this for free? 
going to share for free anyway. If you leave a ministry before you have a ministry, you are out of order. So that I'm going to leave and I'm going to see where God. No, no, no. God does not want you homeless. God is speaking very clearly. Matter of fact, I probably need to spend do a whole Bible study on biblical reasons to leave a church. And so because there are biblical reasons. Most times when we leave, it's not biblical. Right. So when people say, well, I'm going to leave, I don't really know where the Lord is sending me. The Lord is not removing you until he has a home for you. How many people, you know, sell their house and go move in the middle of the street? Like, I just don't know. They may they may not have another house like they had, but they, they know I have a room somewhere. Right. I have an apartment somewhere. Right. I've got somewhere I'm moving to. And so we've got to make sure that we're like, God, what is your will? I know these folk are working my nerves, but what's your will for me? Right. So this issue of supplication. And then here's the last word I want you to write down. I'm going to get back to Ephesians. The word, write down the word surrender. Um, now, this is very important. Even though we are talking about God's will, we're not talking about a plan. I don't surrender to a plan for my life. I surrender to a person who's running my life. See, and the reason this matters is because I don't usually like the plan. I don't like the plan, but I love the person. I'm like, Jesus, you are everything. So I'm surrendered. So this is going to help somebody. If folk are wondering, why are you where you are? Because I surrendered to a person and the person has me where he has me. So when we think about this now, this is very important. For many of us, God is not clearly speaking because he already knows I'm not surrendered. So I have to make up in my mind, whatever you say, it's yes. I have to make up my mind ahead of time for that. And, and, and so, and let me, just, let me just jot this down. Some of you have heard me say this. I think it's a worthy teaching, though. In everything that really matters to us, we must be will neutral. Because if, I'm not, if I already have a, a bias, if I already have a slant, if I already have a preference, what I'm going to do is I am going to interpret every action from my bias. I'm going to interpret everything from my perspective. But if I am will neutral, I'm like, God, whatever way you send me with this, I, I've seen this happen so many times where people have their mind made up about where they're going to go and a situation happens. And like, see, I told you. I'm like, but that's not what that meant. But you made it mean that. See, oh, this is why we got to really be careful about looking for bad stuff for people. Because, because if, I'm, if my mind is made up to see you bad, then whatever I see in you, I'm going to make bad because it needs to I need to fulfill what I what I ultimately wanted to see. And, and so and so we have to have this neutral will to say, God, you know what? I'll go wherever you tell me to go. You know, I, I, I like to go to someplace sunny. But if that's not your will and I'm in Alaska, hey. I'm, I'm, you know, we have a member in Alaska. Let me shout out my member in Alaska. Right. We, so so it's like, God, wherever you are calling me. So we have to decide that that I am willing to be willing. Um, because it's really about the relationship. It's not the road map. See, when you have the right when you run in with the right somebody, I hope maybe there'll be some people that can really acknowledge this. When you're running with the right person, you really don't care what y'all doing. It really doesn't even matter, right? You, you don't really care where you vacate. See, folk who have to, the folk who have to have a certain destination in order for it to be good is just missing the whole joy of the journey with the people. You know, and I think for us, the the best part for me of being here at Word Tabernacle is not where we are landing. It's, it's, it's been our rolling together along the way. 
It's been, it's been the steps and the road map. It's the relationship. That's how we have to think about his will. And so understanding what the will of the Lord is. Chapter four, 5, verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, as we reflect on our conduct, we talked about the big bucket of our standards. We talked about the big bucket of our stability. There's one last big bucket, and that is our spirit. In verse 18, he says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. So let's stop here for a moment. Why is my spirit important as I reflect on my conduct? First of all, my spirit is important as I reflect on my conduct. He gives me, number one, the reason for it. And the reason is in verse 18. He says, do not get drunk with wine. Stop right there. He says, the reason your spirit matters is because who or what is controlling you is important. So he says now he does what only the Holy Ghost would do. No man would have done this. I would be scared to do this. He does what nobody else would have done. He equates being filled with the spirit with being drunk. He equates a holy act with an unholy act by comparison purposes. So let's talk about why he does. All of this is the reason for why my spirit matters. Think about who you know, and some of us won't have to think hard, who get drunk. So now this is, I have an important theological point to make here, so don't miss this. First of all, drunk people, you know, when you know folk that really drink, get intoxicated, get drunk, their behavior changes. Almost to the point where you're like, I, who? Like the person you are sober and the person you are drunk are two different people. You know, and, and it can go, it can sway. It can be like, you can't get them to talk sober. You can't get them to shut up drunk. Nice, nicest person in the world sober. Mean as a snake drunk. This is what he's saying. When we are filled with the spirit, it is a total behavior change. Total. And so if I don't, the reason my spirit matters is because I ought to be a totally different human being. Not only is my conduct totally different, but my conversation is totally different. You know, I know people that are really articulate when they're sober and then they slur words when they when they're drunk. Right. So. He's saying my conversation should change. My conduct should change. Now, this is what's going to blow your mind. And this is the theological ramification of what I'm about to teach. He says, what, what do we know about intoxication? One of the things we know about intoxication is that it's not permanent. Boy, this is good teaching here if y'all get it. So a person could be drunk on Friday, but if they didn't drink Saturday or Sunday, they are no longer intoxicated on Monday. So in order, y'all didn't catch it yet, in order to remain intoxicated, I have to keep drinking. In order to operate in the spirit, I have to keep being filled. And this is where we mess up, y'all. Where we mess up is we get saved and then we think, hey, I'm good. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is permanent. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is permanent. The sealing of the spirit. All of that is irrevocable. All of that is 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 irreversible. But the feeling is dependent on my cooperation with the indwelling. Boy. So this is why 
I can be saved and yet function like I'm not. Because if I'm not constantly being filled, then before you know, you see, don't you act like you haven't seen these folk. You, you saved, they love God, you know they do. And then some days you see them and you're like, what happened to you? You're like, that's not even, that. what happened? They stopped drinking. They, they, the, the, the pro, so this is the reason it matters. Now, what he does with the spirit, he says, the reason is because of this consistency of conversation and conduct that God wants in our life. But then what he does is he gives me the requirements and he says, but be filled with the spirit. Now, when he says, but be filled with the spirit, that's an ongoing behavior. That's something that's happening every day of my life. And so let me talk a little bit about this. I hope, matter of fact, real quick, keep your ribbon in Ephesians. Look with me um, at Matthew 16 for a minute, because some of y'all are acting like this. Y'all not understanding this. Let me give you let me give you an object lesson be, because because it, it'll help make it live. Look at look at Matthew chapter 16. Now, look at verse 13. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Is. Peter confessing Jesus. Right. Um, Jesus says, y'all there, chapter 16, verse 13. Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, asked the disciples, who do people say that I, son of man is? And, and they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, son of the living God. Jesus answered, blessed are you. Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Y'all still with me now? Look at verse 23. It's the same Peter. But he turned and said to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Just that quick. Just that quick. So so this this there's a requirement of me constantly being filled with the spirit. You would be amazed how many times saved people will operate in the flesh. So there's got to be this ongoing filling of the spirit. So, Pastor, how does that happen? I'm glad you asked me. This is how it happens. As you and I read the word. The spirit of God, because we are saved. The indwelling presence of God that's in me will start illuminating, bringing to my attention some truth. As I'm reading the word, he'll he'll start enlarging something for me. He'll show me some sin I need to deal with. He'll show me some conviction I need to live, live out. He shows me some commandment I need to start being obedient to. And so as I now begin to to come into alignment with that. What begins to happen is as I'm yielding to it, I start getting filled again with the spirit and I get the power needed to live it out in practical reality. So if there's not an effort by my part to get close to the word and start making an effort to live it out. See, I don't I don't have all of the power to live it out day one. I just all, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try. I'm going to try not because I know what the word says. So now I'm going to make the effort as I make the effort. The indwelling spirit that's already in me starts to then empower me with a new feeling so that I can really live out what I'm trying to do. See, I, I think a lot of times we want the Holy Ghost to do it without our effort. No, I got it. The reason I did not cuss you out is because I tried not to. Are y'all hearing me? It, and, and, and in my effort of trying the Holy Ghost, it filled me up again to give me all the power I needed to not do it. That's the reason. So he's saying the requirement here is is. 
is to constantly every day be filled with the word. I think this is where a lot of times as believers, we make our mistake. I mean, most times when I'm doing dumb, I'm really removed from the word. I mean, it's just the truth of the matter. As I'm, you know, as I get close to the word, as I have my devotion time, you know, it, basically what it is, is we live hungry. You know how people get real? I'm real evil when I get hungry. Right. You can know like they got those what is it, Snickers commercials, one of those set. Right. Like you, you folk are different hungry. That's just the, we were just we were, my brother's visiting and my sister. And um, we were laughing about this because it's like a trait of Galliard men. We can be really mean spirited when we get hungry. I mean, like to the point of like crying, just like really. And it's just in our DNA. It's in our nature. Well, spiritually, we're the same way. When I've been not eating, it's going to show up. You, because, see, it's in us. We are sinners. So it's in me. To be mean spirit, it's in us. To sin, to fall short, it's in us. But as I draw close to the word, as I start eating, and as I start living out the commandment, as I start addressing the areas of conviction and sin, then the spirit of God enlarges my capacity to begin to live it all out. That's what it means to be filled up on it. So you wonder why you need to come to Bible study every week? Because I need to be filled every week. Why, why do I need a daily devotion? So I can be filled every day. Because I can be like Peter. One day, my profession of faith is on this rock. The next day, the Lord is like, get behind me, devil. And, and so the requirement of it is this ongoing filling. Now, here's the last big thing. The last part of this is what then begins to be the result of this filling. He says, do not get drunk with wine. OK, that's the reason. But that's debauchery. But be filled with the spirit. That's the requirement. What's the results? Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. These are the results. And making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ooh. The whole Bible study next week is submission. So just let you know right now, because it's an area we just struggle with. We really struggle with this. So let, let me let me give you the first result. The first result of living this out is learning to speak with gratitude. Um, he says here, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's strange. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that everything feels good, Tammy. Not that we like everything. But I want us to get this. Everything still has to come across God's desk first. He is kind and loving. He is for us. So the reason that I need to learn to use my words with gratitude is because God is still sovereignly working. Even when I don't understand it, even when it doesn't feel good, even when I don't like it, I have to learn and say, God, you know what? But I thank you because I know I, it's going back to the area of satisfaction. God, I know that this is going to result in a better place for me than this would have. So I thank you for that. I, it wouldn't have been. I want you all to get this. It would not have been my route, God. It would not have been my pathway, God. But I had no clue how this detour, how this other route is actually a better route for me, but it is. So our speech should be characterized by thanksgiving. This is very important. Um, so that means if my speech is characterized by thanksgiving, my speech is never about 
self-exaltation. It is never about demeaning other people. Um, it is never about um, self-indulgence or self-promotion. It is literally, God, I want to thank you. Speak with gratitude. So my speaking is the first result. I think a lot of us claim salvation, but our language does not prove it. The words I speak don't prove it. Um, so first result is in speaking. The second one is in our singing. And really speaking in, in the order of the text, singing should have come first. But And our singing is with gladness. Notice what he says here. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Let me give you, let me break that down real fast. Psalms is literally that. He's like, sometimes just open up the Psalms and sing them. <laughs> just, they, they, they're songs, y'all. They, you know, they just sing them. Um, and what I love about the Psalms is all of them are not pie in the sky. Everything is perfect in my world. People learned to put to music their pain. They put to music their setbacks. They put to music, you know, just the stuff they struggle with. So he says, when y'all are singing to each other, when you sing, sing the songs, because it'll be reminded, a reminder for us that other people that love me have gone through difficulty, and they've been able to sing about it. Then he says hymns. Um, you know, and you know, we, I'm always talking to the music department about this. I mean hymns and anthems. This is what that means. Sing music that is tried and tested. Sing music that has survived multiple generations. You know, when you, you, you the whole room went up immediately Sunday where we've come this far by faith. Right, that, that's a testimony in other generations. Part of the reason young people should learn music from other generations is because they're the byproduct of those experiences, right? So when, you know, so every generation can easily sing Amazing Grace. Come thou fount of every blessing. So, so he says your singing should be reflect gladness based on the Psalms, based upon tried and tested music. And then he says, and based upon the top 100 list right now. Spiritual songs based upon kind of the hot music now, the, the whatever's the gospel stuff now. This is very, I have one, I'm not gonna let us run from this one because we have to challenge ourselves in every generation. My 25 and 30 year olds need to be able to ask themselves, how many hymns can I sing? And my 50 year olds need to know. 60 year olds, how many spiritual songs can I sing? And the reality of it is there has to be a balance, he says, with all of that. So he says, the result is in how I speak. The result is in how I sing. Number three, the result is in my supplication. Giving thanks always and for everything to God. Supplication to God that there should be this constant, ongoing perspective in my life where I'm constantly talking to God, constantly in prayer. And then this is where I'm ending and where we're gonna pick, off, pick up next week with a new sheet. So the result is in my speaking, it's in my singing, it's in my supplicating, and lastly, it is in my submission. And that's where online and in studio, there are no amens. Watch this, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is where we have the hardest thing. Hard, we struggle with this as Christians. You don't have to submit because you like it. I don't have to submit because I agree. I'm supposed to submit out of my reverence for Jesus. So I'm like, you know what? I don't like. So, hey, look, this pastor appreciation month. I'll use myself as an example. You don't have to 
You know, you don't have to be like gung-ho, pastor, I'm with you on everything you do. But you should be submitting out of the reverence of Christ. Amen. Even though I don't get a lot of love on that. So even in our homes, that's why the next statement about wives submission. I'm going to talk about submission in the home next week. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about a whole Bible study, just talking about submission. It is out of reverence for Christ. And so I'm submitting to my boss, not because I think he or she is always right, but I recognize that God is the one who puts people in authority in places of leadership. And out of that reverence for him, I submit. And so as believers, y'all, so here it is, I'm done. As a believer, I need to ask myself, who am I submitting to out of, the, out of reverence for Christ? Mo, mo, I, think, I think the reason... Um, I think the reason online um, church hopping is so popular, you know, I kind of, you should, like our broadcast, for example, you know, it, by, by, once the preaching is done, you know, folk leaving without the benediction, and then they logging on somewhere else, right? Because here's the thing I want you to grab. You know, the person I never come in contact with, I don't, do I really have to submit to them? Nobody knows if I'm submitting. So here's the question. Who's the last person, godly person, saved person, in authority or leadership that you submitted to even though you disagree with them? Most of us can't remember the last time I submitted in disagreement. He says that should be my conduct, that I should submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. So this week, we fit, this spent us, what, two weeks on this? Three, it's been three weeks on this sheet. This, these are the group discussion questions. Where we started this whole conversation, you know, talking about sex. I think that was three weeks ago. So first group discussion question, what has influenced your views of sex? Um, secondly, similarly, have my, has my view of sex changed over the years? So do I see it differently now that I'm saved? Third group discussion is, how have I walked in love this week? And we talk, go back to the other teachings. We talked about what it looks like to walk in love and to walk in light. So how have I walked in love this week? Letter D, how have I walked in light this week? Letter E, what are some of the wisest choices you have made in your life? Because it talks about how we ought to make wise choices and how we ought to be in the will of God. Let's talk about that. And then finally, how are hymns and spiritual songs different today than in Paul's time? And so talk about some of that this week. And, and then let's take a moment and go through the notes on submission. And to say, God, um, or the notes rather on the will of God. God, how... What do I need to improve upon so that I can more clearly hear and understand your will? Say amen if you can. Thanks for listening to Orthos. I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.